Okay, we'll just get started. So hello everybody, I'm Kevin, or K-Ball. Um, I am a panelist on the JS Party podcast. Now who here has ever heard of JS Party? One in the back, and one of the, the MC. Well that's good, y'all invited that us. That doesn't so, count. Uh, yeah, so JS Party is a podcast we publish weekly, um, focusing on all elements of the JavaScript ecosystem and things web. Um, so obviously there's a lot of stuff talking about React. Uh, just had a conversation that should publish uh, today US time, so you know, evening um, with one of the folks from Gatsby, kind of covering a range of different JavaScript related topics. Um, and we also come out to events like this. So we will do live shows at events. Um, I'm interviewing a number of the speakers. That Those are often published, things like that. So um, this will be a live show. Now the structure for today's event, uh, we have all of our advice panel panelists. Um, they have been answering people's questions. Um, so I have a few pre-prepared questions, but I think broadly the opportunity here is to say, okay, what's actually bubbling up in the ecosystem? You know, if you're answering questions, you're doing workshops, like what are people getting confused about? Where are the challenges? Maybe we can get some of that content out to you here in the audience and to the listeners who are going to listen to this uh, in about a week from now. This will be published to the podcast. Um, so throughout this, if you have questions, you know, when we do a, a regular show, we have a, we broadcast it live and we have a Slack channel where people participate. Well, you are our Slack channel today. So if you have questions, raise your hand up. I will try to, to get those questions in um, and then I will repeat them so that everybody can hear it and the panelists will answer. Now we do have only two handheld mics, so we are going to be passing around um, a little bit. So forgive us if there's a little bit there. But, um, first off, then, let me introduce all of our panelists, um, and I'm going to try to make sure that I pronounce everybody's name right. Um, so on this side, we're starting with Michelle, who was the creator of, or author of MobX. <laughs> Next we have Mike Grabowski, the co-founder of Callstack.io and a member of the React Native core team. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Vladimir, who is developer relations at Hasura and a consultant and speaker. Yeah, hi everyone. Next, Kitsa. Uh, did I pronounce it right? Kitsa? That was, I was having trouble Kitsa. with that earlier. Um, who is the founder of React Academy? No, I'm just a vlogger. <laughs> <laughs> and. Okay. And then uh, Andre, who is an independent web developer and designer. Uh, hi. So I'm going to kick things off with one of my questions, because one of the great things about doing this is I get to get my questions answered. Um, it, I've noticed a big pattern in the React world and the front end world broadly is that we have increasing numbers of solutions related to state management. Uh, it seems like, you know, we had the framework explosion and now we have the state management explosion and, you know, answering questions in the advice lounge, we had experts here talking about MobX, which is focused on state management. Hooks were one of the big motivating factors declared about hooks was, oh, we can use this to better manage our state. GraphQL, which is also essentially a state management solution. So I'm going to aim this question at Michelle first, MobX. What are you seeing um, going on in the state management things? Like, are these solutions sort of evolving towards each other, or, or what's happening here? Um, I think the interesting thing in state management uh, is still uh, underway to be happening, and that's like the impact that suspense and concurrent mode will have. Um, I hear people saying that, that like hooks and context and the recent APIs related to that uh, did change the game. Uh, I don't think that's, that's the case. Um, they made thinks the API is much better, uh, but they didn't fundamentally introduce new possibilities. Um, and so sometimes people are like, oh, since there is now standardized context and standardized hooks, I don't need state management anymore. Uh, my simple answer is then, then you ne didn't need it before, because everything that you can do now with hooks and context, you could already do before. I mean, they made the API easier, they made composition easier, but they didn't, in essence, uh, introduce uh, new concepts. And I think in general that the state management game uh, is still quite stable. Uh, Ryan Florence was tweeting earlier this week that there's basically three kinds of states. 
Um, the state that is very specific to your uh, domain, your persistent state, the things you send to the server, things you want to keep if your uh, uh, office burns down. And there's just the, the state that lives in your component, uh, either abstracted away or not. Uh, and I think that separation uh, still will remain, and it will, that separation will be more clear. Um, because there's now less reason to use state management solutions uh, for local state. Um, but I think, th I think that's the big separation, state that lives inside components, and state that lives uh, outside because it's generic for your application, or it's required in many different places in the same application. And for the latter, um, I still see GraphQL mostly as a transportation layer, um, which might be sufficient if the data matches very directly what you're uh, receiving for, for the backend. And if there's any transformation in between, I still think that um, state management libraries are a great place to make that mapping between whatever you receive from backend and what you want to display, and usually what you want to enrich on the data. Uh, so uh, regarding GraphQL, I just uh, can totally relate to that, um, that lots of people overuse, um, well GraphQL you obviously can switch everything to use just GraphQL for your local state, and it's good, but some people um, overuse that as, uh, as you said, like the, having GraphQL as transportation layer and still, uh, still keeping things in, uh, in state management solution that you use will uh, probably make it easier to adopt GraphQL in, in your ecosystem because you're already using some kind of state management solution and just adding GraphQL as a transportation layer, maybe using some uh, local state for GraphQL and doing this connection with the uh, with the state management that you use, uh, it's something that uh, that is evolving right now. Like people, uh, the pe people use it uh, more often. Um, yeah, so that's I, what I want. Have you ever talked state management in the GraphQL era? Maybe for two years. I'm just recycling the same talk because I believe that GraphQL changed the game of state management. And it's a bit ironic because I was preaching that hey, now with GraphQL, you don't even need a state management library on the on the client, right? And then eventually when you have a complex client, like let's say you're building a calendar or something that has tons of interactions and stuff, then you see that like hooks and context and everything like that we have. I also get that question in workshops like, can we replace Redux now with context and hooks? No, because Redux is using those technologies underneath in order to provide you with the Redux API. So you cannot replace Redux with hooks and context. When you have complex state, you still want to have something more advanced. For example, something that has observables. Not that Michelle is here, but whenever I have like some more complex state management and I have a model that has like more than 600 lines of code, I'm still going to reach out to Mobex or Mobex State Tree to handle that code instead of handling it with hooks. So GraphQL is solving like 90% of the problems because it's solving the data problem. You don't have to think about it anymore. But then the last 10% when you have like complex state management scenarios, they still, you still have to reach out for a solution. Some people reach for Redux, some for Mobex or whatever you're using. But I don't think that client state management is solved for now. We, we're still waiting for some like silver bullet solution that's going to solve both the client side and the server side with fetching data with GraphQL. So yeah. Anyone else wants to add something? Yeah. Um, I just want to add uh, um, for um, using for uh, local state for a component is totally fine. Like s s a state management solution is good for uh, maybe more complex state as well as GraphQL is good for uh, uh, transportation layer. But still, if you have some kind of counter on your page, you don't need to add this counter to your state management solution. Uh, and just uh, you can just relay on local state is good enough. Uh, yeah, just wanted to add that. Mm -hmm. uh, question, yes. Uh, uh, oh, great. Uh, question uh, more about uh, new possibilities, new tools uh, which we need. Uh, I'm thinking or asking that uh, we have uh, not new kind of uh, application. It's like online collaboration tool like Wiki or Google Docs more. And uh, how state management can help us uh, to build this solution more easily than uh, uh, we can build it now because it's like edge uh, technology right now because you need to synchronize uh, state across many clients. You need to do it efficiently, easily uh, and uh, 
you need to solve a conflict between different uh, clients because we still have a low connection and uh, we need to solve it somehow. And uh, as I uh, see people who start uh, using this uh, building uh, these uh, online synchronization tools, they struggle a lot to build something reliable. They spent uh, like a year to build something usable. Uh, maybe you have uh, comments and ideas how GraphQL, Mobix, uh, or maybe next uh, tool uh, deal with that. i talking about Mobix uh, state tree solution maybe can address that. I guess I'll give this microphone to Michelle then. <laughs> yes, um, when it comes to synchronizing changes um, and especially rebasing and handling conflicts, um, there are a couple of problems. Um, one thing that doesn't help you is being able to time travel. Uh, I see that people often start with that, but it does, just is, doesn't fit for uh, multi actor systems. So you need um, to be able to do either one of two things. Uh, the one is you need to be able to replay your actions so that you can um, distribute actions and then make sure that everybody replays them in a consistent order so that everybody ends up in the same state. I think that's the best solution in general. Um, the second uh, solution is to be able to generate uh, and replay patches. Uh, that's kind of the general, generalized form of uh, actions. So you're basically recording what mutations did happen, and then you're replaying those. Um, that also works, and it's usually simpler to set up. Uh, for example, um, if you are using Mobix State Tree or Immer or something like that, you can get a patches. The problem with patches is that conflict resolution is harder. Um, because you cannot really determine what the user intended to do from patches, while you can still reason about what the user intended to do if you have a description of the actions that were uh, emitted. And so, um, in any case, I recommend uh, if this is the core of your uh, project and it's really important to do it well, um, you need to make sure that you have an explicit um, piece of code in your application where actions are dispatched and are described in a serializable manner. And whether you use Redux for that or Mobix State Tree doesn't in that sense really matter. Uh, in the end, most of the complexity comes from the fact that how you handle a conflict doesn't, isn't a problem that is solvable in an abstract way. Because what the meaning of a conflict is always depends uh, on the meaning of your data for your application. So some conflicts, um, it's fine to just elect randomly a winner. For other uh, conflicts, um, you want to make sure that no decision is being made automatically by the application and that the user has to redo things or loses his action. Answering that question depends on, the, on your problem domain. So um, you cannot get proper conflict handling standardized in a state management solution for that reason. But having replayable actions gets, gets you a far way. Um, adding to that answer, I can totally relate. And actually, uh, I just been at the uh, AppJS conference, I think last week, um, or maybe two weeks ago. And there was a great talk by Eric Vicenti about uh, his brand new cloud framework called Avon, which is for building um, web and mobile apps. And one of its features is, is essentially implementing this conflict resolution mechanism where you can think of it as a Redux on the server where you essentially store your actions and then they are replayed on the server for the conflict resolution mechanism. So if you are looking for a, for a solution to that problem or a candidate to that, sol to that problem, uh, then I would recommend you just looking at that tool and, and, and the talk maybe. And if not, the framework itself will be suitable for you. Maybe just the concepts or the ideas that he presented um, um, might work for you too. So that's kind of the, the use case for state management that I still see these days, such as Redux or Mobex, as opposed to the component state um, being the conflict resolution and you know sort of sharing the state between uh, different apps. And also, for example, if you want to store the native side of things in React Native, that's also useful for you to have. So I want to add on uh, GraphQL side. So on GraphQL, lots of things are um, 
kind of already solved if you use subscriptions uh, and you, if you have reliable um, uh, usage of subscriptions. But sometimes people overuse that. Sometimes people just use, uh, for example, if they use a Apollo client uh, and they use a subscription component as a component of the render probe, they rely just on data getting back from the server and uh, will be reloaded on the page. At some instances when we have these conflicts, you will have a uh, flash of content that you don't need, right? So there is a pattern of using subscription as sort of notificator and instead of rendering something on the page, uh, whenever subscription gets back to the client, you basically update Apollo cache with the, uh, the data that you have a control of. So that really uh, connects to what you said, like by like replaying uh, things on the client, you can totally connect that to, uh, um, to, to things that you said and use the subscription as a method of m notifying the client something has changed and then you have the ability to do whatever you want. So I was actually interested in this problem, so I was poking in the network tools for Todoist, for Notion, for Google Calendar, just to see what they're doing. And basically I think every, every one of these big companies have, have built their own like sort of like caching client server mechanism for synchronizing the changes. So I don't think they're using like GraphQL subscriptions or, I mean GraphQL subscriptions are a step towards the solution, but I think it's still not like a silver bullet solution for this problem. So if you look at Google Calendar, Todoist and Notion, have you, when I tried Notion for the first time, I'm like, what the hell is going on? Probably the client state management is so complex. That ca this cannot be solved with simple like GraphQL or Apollo cache or something. So you have like super complex client state management in Notion and like every second or after every action, they're dispatching some sort of weird JSON object to the server. They're, they're serializing, deserializing and then doing something on the server. But it's still like some custom mechanism and I don't think it's available as a library that you can just plug in and just use whatever they're using. So you, you wanted to add something? I, I would just add it. Uh, there is actually a library made by Andrei Sitnik. I don't know if you heard of him. Uh, he made Logux, which is, uh, yeah, so, so the whole idea of here is to, to operate not on a JSON, not on a uh, snapshot, but on an operation log. So, uh, so the tricky part of the operation log is you want to make the timestamps uh, uh, function between server and client in a reliable way, that is a hard problem, not the, like, so if you could solve that problem, we wouldn't have conflicts at all because, you know, we could ID every uh, item in a, in a log in the right way, but that's kind of unsolvable problem. Uh, so he tried to solve it in a way CRDT kind of uh, paper, so look, look up for CRDT. I think that's the latest we got in, in theory. It sometimes, like it works in 99% cases he uh, said. Uh, so check out Logux. Uh, it's like Redux, this operation log, so probably it might be a solution for you. I don't know, like uh, reach out to Andre, he, he's really pushing it forward so he might be a help for you, yeah. Make down there. Yeah. Just as a small thing, just to demonstrate why the problem is not solvable in a generic way. Um, even if we can fix the timing and rebasing problem, uh, the problem is there's semantic meaning to all your data. And to give a very simple example, suppose you have two users seeing the same variable x. And x, uh, both of them see the value of x is 1. And behind it you put a button that increases the number by 1. Now both see 1 and both press the button simultaneously. Then the, the question is what should the end result be that both users see? Should it be two, because they both increment from one to two? Or should it be three, because both incremented? And so the answer to that question depends on what the number means. So if the number means that like how many uh, people did visit this page or something, then the answer should be three, because both users um, visited the page. But if the meaning of that number is like how many entities are allowed at the conference, then both of them intended to set it to two because they wanted like two seats to be available or something. So the meaning of an increment doesn't depend on how you solve the conflict, it depends on what the action means from the main perspective. And that is the reason why the problem is not generically uh, solvable because you want to handle conflicts in a different way depending on the meaning of your data. Great question. That yeah. sparked a good yeah. discussion. <laughs> um, <coughs> I have more questions, but I'm curious before I do, anyone had a really good question come in via the advice lounge earlier that you think would be good to get more perspectives on? 
Well, um, I had a really interesting question regarding n plus one problem in GraphQL and how it's uh, solved. So I am um, 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 working at Hatsura as a developer advocate, and some people ask me about like how it's uh, solved and what are the challenges with n plus one problem. So the, basically, the idea is uh, like Facebook uses data loader. Some solutions use uh, different solutions uh, too. Um, the, the idea is for every type you have a resolver that will uh, fetch the data, so you'll get the n plus one uh, SQL statements if you're connected to a database. So um, the question was how we solve it, and uh, in Hasura, so we basically. Uh, uh, and basically, it's a kind of a generic solution that you can use not only by using a source engine, but um, implementing your own thing. If you uh, manage to compile your uh, resolvers to some kind of one SQL statement, um, that you will solve this problem. This is one of the questions I have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if you like how many sessions you already had because I just arrived like one hour ago. Uh, and I only had one, so <laughs> um, uh, so the question was, uh, like, how many of you are writing React Native here? Okay, and uh, the rest, I assume, is doing React, right? Or, okay, and are you interested in writing React Native or not at all? <laughs> okay, so the question you might find useful was, how can I get started with React Native and whether that requires a lot of native knowledge? And so, basically, the answer was, that you can try with Expo if you don't want to write native code. Uh, but, you know, the uh, second answer to that question was that the native knowledge you need in order to write React Native is not really that scary. It's all about knowing how the project looks like and how you can start it. Problems will be when you want to release it, but trust me, when you get to the release step, you'll be a great native developer. So don't get scared about that at the beginning, you know. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Question from the audience. Hi, my, my name is Isham, software developer. I'm a .NET developer, and I am very familiar with Xamarin when I develop native apps. What is now the main advantage when I move to React Native? And I have good React uh, skills also. Well, um, so that's a good question. Uh, I'll try to answer as best as I can, though I never used Xamarin. I only have uh, conceptual knowledge about that. But there is a great friend of mine that I promised I'm gonna reach out to. Uh, his name is Ram, and he had talk in the morning. And speaking from his past employer, I think he knows a bit of Xamarin, so he might tell you a bit more about that. But <laughs> the way I think about it is, you know, for me, the biggest deal of React Native compared to Xamarin or Flutter because probably a lot of people are thinking about like Flutter 2, um, is that React Native is using platform controls. So when I'm building a React Native app, what happens is I'm actually using the native platform controls and the native gestures and everything that comes with the platform. Um, I'm just embracing. And I'm also using JavaScript, which is pretty cool language for me uh, in the native world because it's very expressive and allows me to write things fast, like parsing JSON data structures, like this has been always my nightmare in Objective C. So I can imagine that in you know .NET, it's it's also kind of less, uh, let's say, scripty. That in JavaScript, you just can't call probably JSON parse and randomly access on typed object. That's <laughs> that's the uh, that's the um, advantage, let's say, we we have. Uh, so for me, for me, that's it. And you know, like these two are probably the biggest advantages for me. There might be others from the performance perspective uh, that somebody else might want to cover too. Um, yeah, so I might be wrong, but I, um, like what what I've seen, um, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, the Xamarin uh, does have uh, um, the same robust solution for GraphQL that uh, React Native has. Uh, as well as Flutter. And GraphQL is changing a lot in mobile mobile ecosystem because, uh, and it came from the need to uh, do less requests to the server or to uh, get like on the lower end of devices to get the traffic faster and to get uh, all the data that we need. And I don't see it avail uh, available in Xamarin nor Flutter. And uh, this is one of the additional um, like pros towards uh, React Native. I think that's that's a, that's a very very right point. Um, back in the day, I've been looking into um, Elixir and plenty of other crazy technologies because I felt like 
if you are a software developer, you got to learn something more than just JavaScript. And the problem for me was that as soon as I wanted to use like GraphQL and other you know technologies that are sort of to go choices in JavaScript, I've discovered that the libraries in, in those ecosystems were not really you know up to date and they were just catching up. So it was one of the like, things that sort of told, like, put me off and where I was like, I'm just gonna stick to JavaScript for production because surprisingly, you know, like, uh, you get support for these libraries usually from the authors of the technology itself. So that's pretty cool. I think also one last thing to mention is like the knowledge is very transferable. If you already have like a web app and if you have a team working with React, you can easily transfer them to like work on React Native and even like share components and share like I've seen like apps who have like I don't know was it some GitHub client had like 80% of code reusability between web and two native clients for Android and, and iOS. So I think you can also share a lot of things. And if you already have a knowledge of I know React and I know GraphQL with Apollo, you can just transfer it easily to React Native. So you have the advantage or the advantage of having access to this entire ecosystem who's constantly, I think it's evolving more than the other, like I don't want to bash on the other ones, but a lot of innovation is happening right now in this one. So that's also a big advantage. Like I'm not a native developer, but I can sit down and in a week, like I gave a React Native workshop at a company for a week and I wasn't the React Native developer. I just sat down, looked at the docs and I'm like, okay, this is just React but for native. So that's a, a big advantage, yeah. That sounds like a topic for your next vlog, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing, like React Native uh, long term goal is to be, you know, less native. Um, like when I had a chat with the React and React Native team back at the React Conf, the, uh, the general feeling was that we should stop speaking of React Native as a separate thing because React Native essentially could be just React but rendered on different platforms. And so there is no way, no reason for, you know, um, differentiating these. And the long term goal we have with React Native, I believe, is to decrease the amount of native knowledge you need to know. And that's also what we are trying to accomplish with, you know, uh, the, the CLI and the tools that we build around React Native to make the, um, your, your experience working with dependencies and native code as smooth as possible. So, you know, we are still somewhere in the middle of our road, but we know where we had it. So this should be improving with every month. So it's, it's, it's unrelated to the technology choice, but more on the uh, architectural level. I, I think this uh, remove, remo or um, blurring the line between native and non-native is, uh, in, uh, it's really important to keep in mind uh, the architectural choices and the, the things I, I talked today about primitives. I think it's, it's even more important to think about UI elements as a primitive and not going uh, to use like uh, HTML primitive, for example, if it's web. Uh, trying to put them in um, abstracted primitives uh, because by doing so early you could save a lot of time when you start uh, thinking about okay now I want to build a, a native app uh, using same buttons, inputs and uh, etc. right? Uh, because you can abstract the rendering uh, target completely. So yeah I think it's important to keep this in mind but, uh, that architecting the app, you, the whole user interface. All right. We are getting close to the end. We probably have time for one more question. So yeah. we have a uh, question coming in from the audience. Check. Yeah. Uh, a question regarding uh, React Native. So recently we've seen some articles that mm, some companies are leaving React Native and then want to write their application with React Native. So the question, uh, what do you think? Is it still around? Is it still reasonable to start a new application with React Native or better to you know, hire uh, a command like with real native guys who will write the <coughs> real native application for uh, iOS, Android. What do you think? So I have a, uh, I have a great example. I can't really, uh, uh, I mean, I have a great example how React Native can be better than native uh, native apps. Um, like I personally built with uh, a few of my friends at my company, we built um, a media player uh, for, you know, um, for singles. And fun fact is that the company came to us having already built mobile app uh, one, by one of the best agencies in Europe and they were struggling with the performance and we were able to outperform performance of the native app with React Native two years ago without all the great things that we have right now. So 
it is totally doable and um, actually the, the reason their approach was slow was that it was all imperative. So the declarative nature of React Native sort of won. Um, regarding your question about companies leaving, you know, it's always uh, gonna happen because, you know, it's like React Native itself is not a silver bullet and it's getting great adaption at different businesses and they are trying React Native to see whether it's, it fits their business goals and architecture and so one of the, um, um, one of the approaches, like with React Native, there is the, the brownfield approach where you integrate React Native into existing infrastructure and the greenfield one when you start from scratch. And so it always can happen that when you start integrating React Native into native app, it will not work for you. And you know, like for Airbnb, it didn't work out in the long term because just because of the trade-offs were not worth for them. Um, and I think the article was pretty uh, explicit about that. But there are hundreds of companies using React Native and actually thousands of apps in the App Store. Um, I'm not sure if I can disclose the number um, and how it was mined, but there is a lot of you know, React Native applications out there and they are pretty, pretty, in a pretty good shape. And you know, last year when we were talking about React Native, there were a lot of people like asking me and other contributors, you know, like how's React Native looking like, whether it's gonna be the thing or it's gonna sort of vanish. Um, and the general sort of feeling inside the community was that, you know, like we could do better and it's like everybody was slowly getting out of ideas. But things dramatically improved since then and over like last year, things changed from being, you know, not so good to being amazing. We have a lot of great development going on, such as, you know, the new re-architecture that will allow great things to happen, especially for the native developers. So a lot of these advantages that these companies are talking about right now will be totally uh, gone in a matter of few months. So I'd say there is a really, really bright future ahead in front of React Native. And uh, I'm saying that after exploring Flutter and other technologies for mobile alternatives, I'm still thinking that React Native is going to be, like it's the best technology right now on the market for that particular cross-platform solution and like I've checked the others and you know like speaking of trade-offs, I think it's just the best one unless you don't need a cross-platform app then you know, like if you're building a game then you know like probably just build native app and that's not the failure of React Native, it's just <laughs> you know like for that particular app you, you just need native code. I know you work with React Native a lot. Like, I mean, that's, that's basically your job. But what I want to mention and what you're forgetting is Facebook this year is forming the Avengers initiative for fixing React Natives where they're hiring like all the, they're forming this team who's sitting down and properly like addressing all the problems that React Native has. So it, when I saw that GitHub issue about, hey community, what kind of problems do you have? Here's like thousand problems that we have. Here's how we're gonna address them. So I think now they're gonna double down on fixing and making it stable and I think it's just gonna get, they're just getting started with React Native and more and more companies are gonna adopt it because now it's finally they're properly sitting down and forming like putting more effort and more engineering effort into actually working on React Native. So yes. I think it's just getting started. I know that we are running out of time but I just want to mention a couple of things quick, quick, quick. So um, uh, Kita, that's a very important thing you said. I just got too much technically, you know, into that matter. Uh, like last year, you know, the React Native team was sort of getting smaller. There were a lot of people leaving and, you know, this year, like it's growing super quick. So many great developers joining, the team is just getting bigger and you can see that by the contributions that happen. We had the uh, London Trash between Facebook and contributors from the community. That was the first hackathon ever we got together and there is already one planned to happen later this year. So the collaboration between Facebook and community is getting better and that's the, uh, the most important thing because historically, that was the thing that wasn't that good and now it's improving so the more we keep being synced with Facebook and the more we work together on fixing issues and improving the framework towards the direction we all want to use it, then it's gonna be good. So there is this React Native community organization on GitHub, uh, check it out. There is uh, a lot of information about what's happening in React Native, where we are headed. Uh, if you want to help, that's the place to check out and all the information you probably wanted to ask but we don't have time, you can see there. Uh, thank you. So. We do have to wrap up. It is now lunchtime, but let's get a hand for this panel, huh? <laughs> and if you like listening to brilliant minds like this and you like picking their brains, uh, you know, we can't go to a conference every week, but the podcast publishes every week and we do a live episode. We stream it live. You can pick the panelists' brains using Slack rather than in person, but uh, 
Here in Europe, I guess it would be in the evenings. It, po it goes live on uh, Thursdays, 1 Eastern US, which I think is, what is that? 10 o'clock here, 9 o'clock? I don't know. Evenings uh, here, but um, so you go to changelog.com slash JS party. You can check it out. We're available in all of your podcast applications, um, whatever you might like, and you can get this level of thought and energy and excitement every week. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>